faithful stewards of the various lands that we're on. We also acknowledge our ancestors. We acknowledge those who have toiled without compassion or compensation and many forms of racism. We acknowledge all the elders and community stalwarts whose shoulders we stand on as we build, share, and learn together for our collective liberation and sovereignty. Now let's introduce our panelists for this afternoon. Sherez Pura is the Financial Reporting Manager at Libro Credit Union. She has been with Libro since 2019 and has extensive experience in accounting, assurance, and risk management. She holds an Honors Business Administration from the Richard Ivey School of Business and is a Chartered Professional Accountant. She currently oversees Libro's reg regulatory financial reporting and brings her passion for the environment to Libro's Climate Change Working Group as the organization navigates their climate change journey. She's a dog lover, an avid sewist, and a power lifter. Welcome. Next, we have Jonathan. Jonathan is Van City's Vice President of Government Relations and Public Affairs, helping tell the Van City story to members, the public and leaders, to members, the public and leaders throughout our community. He began his career in journalism, first at Globe and Mail, and then the victorious, uh, the Vancouver Sun, where he was the legislative bureau chief in Florida. Following that, he worked as a communications and pop organizations. Jonathan has degrees in film studies and journalism and is an alumni at the Global Alliance for Banking on Values Leadership Academy. He also serves on the board of the Dr. Peters AIDS Foundation. In his free time, Jonathan enjoys running, cycling, skiing, and exploring the Gulf Islands with his wife, kids, and dogs. Welcome. Next, we have Victor Beausoleil. As a lecturer, Victor Beausoleil has traveled extensively throughout Canada, the United States, UK, and Africa for speaking engagements for community organizations, institutions, and philanthropic foundations. Victor has been a board member of the Atkinson's Charitable Foundation, a member of the Grant Review Committee of the Laidlaw Foundation, and the Toronto Housing Community Housing Social Investment Fund. Victor is currently on the board on the board of directors for the Toronto Community Benefit Network, the board president of SEDNET, which is the Canadian Community Economic Development Network, um, on the loan review committee for the Fair Finance Fund, on the advisory of the Table of Impact Investment Practitioners, and the advisory of the New Power Labs, Marigold Capital, and on the board of REAC, the uh, Regional Ethno Advisory Council for Correction Services Canada. He's also on the board of Tribe Network and the co-founder of the Canadian Centre for Nonprofits uh, Digital Resilience. The Toronto Star, Toronto Sun, National Post, Share Newspaper and the Caribbean Camera have all highlighted Victor's work in communities across Canada. Victor is currently the CEO of Intuit Consultant Consulting and the founder and executive director of SETSI, the social economic, social economy through social inclusion coalition. Victor has written 13 books and is a husband and father of four brilliant children. Welcome, Victor. Uh, unfortunately, our panelist, Dr. Amara Rolstein, is unable to attend today um, for personal reasons, and our colleague Chuck um, Odingbo is running a few minutes behind. So we'll begin, and hopefully Chuck will uh, jump online to join us shortly. So let's start with a question for Shiraz. With the help of Green Economy London, Libro conducted your first ever greenhouse gas emissions assessment on your operations. How was that journey for your institution? Thanks, Sarah. Um, our journey to conduct our greenhouse gas assessment was very informative and eye-opening. It's allowed us to narrow in on where exactly key areas for future reduction strategies will be. So specifically for Libro, we identified that um, our top operational GHGs were in items like employee community commuting and uh, the steam and natural gas that's used in our actual physical locations at our branches. So um, as we chart out our path to net zero, um, this information will be used to help uh, uh, inform uh, 
how to go about that. So um, I'd like to highlight too that while it's important to have our house in order, so to speak, that would be our operational um, greenhouse gas emissions, we're also um, in the process of trying to understand what our financed emissions are. And what I mean by financed emissions is as a lending institution, the loans that we fund to businesses, those businesses then go on and um, generate greenhouse gas emissions depending on what industries they're in. So as purveyors of capital, um, you know, we, we have a responsibility and an obligation to understand what are the greenhouse gas emissions that we're funding through our loans. So our operational assessment has informed how our own operations and our buildings and our branches contribute to climate change. However, financed emissions would be about 70 times is, is generally the estimate of the impact um, on the climate. So we're currently in the process of now that we've got our, our operational assessment, we're now in a spot where we can look forward and understand what are our financed emissions. So it's been a great stepping stone to make that jump. That's incredible. That's incredible. Thank you for that. Uh, our next question is for Jonathan. Van City has set remarkable climate commitments with an aim to achieve net zero by 2040. Tell us about that journey so far. Yeah, and I think uh, sure I thank you for that. I think you you you've kind of set up well the the you know the journey that that each financial institution is on and the difference for folks when you hear about someone uh, you know kind of making a commitment to net zero. What does that mean as a financial institution? Does that mean that you know through through your operations? Uh, you know, you're trying to reduce your own emissions, or are you looking to to, to kind of uh, assess and understand uh, each dollar that you're lending out, what the what the emissions are attributable to that one? And that's where uh, where our journey uh, kind of started a, a few years ago is kind of really uh, doing that same moment of kind of uh, exploration, and and in a world that hadn't fully wrapped its arms around uh, that that piece. And I think for us. Really looking at it and saying, you know, every day in in in, in all of our branches, people are making decisions uh, about who gets a loan or who doesn't. Uh, people are 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 having that moment of of conversation with folks, and so for us, uh, we have uh, we have measured uh, all of the emissions attributable to to every well the, the the majority of loans. If you've got say a line of credit, we we actually don't understand. We don't know what you're doing with that. But if you've got a mortgage, we know. Uh, the, the the square footage of your house, you know, the value of your house, you have some basic information about where it is in the province and, and, and how big it is and, and what its emissions profile might be. So we've done a first, uh, for two years, we've done a, 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 an assessment of uh, how much emissions across our, our small business portfolio, across our residential and commercial mortgage portfolio. We don't lend to fossil fuel companies. So our, our starting point on emissions is really focused in residential uh, real estate and small business. The next step is that uh, we have modeled out our journey to, to net zero by, by 2040, which is our commitment. You, you mentioned that, Sarah. And, and that I think is, is uh, you know, is, is holds the kind of ambition that makes a guy like me, uh, you know, uh, stay up late some nights wondering how we're going to get there. Um, but uh, but the truth on, on it is we've modeled it out, we've looked at it very carefully, and we've said, if we're going to get to net zero by 2040, uh, we need to, to hold ourselves accountable in the short term. So we've said that by 2025, we need to reduce uh, emissions uh, by 17% across our residential portfolio and by 27% across our commercial lending portfolio. Think about that. Like, it's not that far away. Uh, and so, you know, I know we'll talk a little bit more about about how that flows into the culture of the organization, but it really has focused people's energy and attention on, on how we get there and started a conversation about how we do that in a way that is equitable and doesn't simply, uh, you know, drive further divides uh, between those who can afford to make uh, energy retrofits and upgrades, those who can't. Uh, and so that that is a big part of the work. And I, I hope we get a chance to, to talk about that as well. 
Absolutely. Thank you for that. Uh, and to both you and uh, Shiraz for just being trailblazer, play, trailblazers within your organization and, you know, creating, creating a path for others. Thank you. Victor, this question's for you. In terms of work that SETSI's doing uh, in, in the climate action space, can you share your organizational journey? Yeah, absolutely. Um, our, our journey actually started with my wife, funny enough. Um, my wife um, always has her hands in the soil and had an initiative around separation at source and really had me lean in on certain texts. And one of the first books I read was Values by Mark Carney that really um, explained to me some of the challenges that we're having, not just that uh, the stuff that I'd read before from Vedanish um, and, and, and others in the climate space, but specifically around climate finance and how institutions are actually looking at reducing emissions and some of the things that our colleagues have shared already. One of the auspicious things about this conversation is the fact that we've identified over the past year some remarkable climate entrepreneurs within financial institutions, especially those that are not um, lending or in the fossil fuel space. So our, my journey started with my wife. Um, and, and in our work at SETSI, we, we premise all our, our, our functions on African proverbs, but African principles. So as a saying, wo in sa damwa, wo in sa damwa, if your hands are in the dish. So, so when we recognize that we were trying to create better economic outcomes for our people, how are people going to live if Mother Earth or Asasiya is being extracted from at such dis disproportionate levels? So we started something very basic, a study group. And the study group was a group of pe primarily people of African descent, racialized folks coming together on a monthly basis to unpack books and texts around climate action. Um, we unpacked the IPCC, uh, the IPCC reports, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change reports. This was a remarkable um, a demonstration of leadership because these are folks on the ground, the people, are not ac academics, not folks within the climate finance or even climate action space, but just regular everyday Canadians that wanted to lean in and find out how they can one, reduce their own emissions personally, their family, but as well get involved in movement building. So through that study group, we built a relationship with Athabasca University, our colleague Mike Lewis from Synergia, Mike Toy from Sednet and others, and actually started a full-fledged project, which has been remarkable for us. And since then, and since the study group, we built out a couple of frameworks which are unique. One of them I'll share quickly. Um, Jonathan actually attended one of the design thinking labs. So we're building out an initiative called the Chorus Climate Consortium. The premise of this consortium is we've identified that a lot of times when new newcomers, immigrants, racialized migrants come to our country, there's this very capitalistic lens of we're going to get you employment ready or help you build a business. But who's helping these folks actually build social purpose organizations or social enterprises, especially with climate venture caveats? So we looked, we did about 40 key informant interviews. We had three design thinking labs. Jonathan attended one. And more importantly, we actually connected with some of the immigrant serving organizations across the country and some of the remarkable accelerators like Radius that are doing this work. And the plan is to actually build out regional nodes, program delivery partners. So in terms of our journey um, and your initial question, Sarah, um, it's, it's not nascent, but it's rooted in the people and rooted in principles that I think align with the values shared by both our colleagues today. Thank you. Our next question is for Sharad. Libra is currently following the guidance of the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures and has conducted a climate maturity assessment to take stock of your current climate management actions in terms of change management. How has that process been? Thanks, Sarah. Um, I would say right off the bat, we are very fortunate in that we have the full support of our board of directors and CEO in terms of our climate change journey. So having that buy-in and tone at the top is really crucial for driving that change and, and having the backing to do so, because it's a really large undertaking that we're, we're undergoing. And uh, I'll just say it was nice to hear Jonathan speak to where um, his organization is at in the process, because we're following in your footsteps, so to speak, but we're just a little bit behind. So it's kind of nice to see you guys have achieved what we're what we've set out to do. Um, really interesting there. So um, what we've done so far is um, in order to help set us up for success, um, set up an actual climate change steering committee that consists of key individuals throughout the organization from all aspects credit, governance, finance, operations, um, understanding that it's really a full organizational commitment and not just one particular person or one department. Um, we've also 
created a new position um, unique to Libro in that we have a climate change specialist. Um, this is a very new role and it helps us have one full-time staff member actually dedicated to seeing this vision through in addition to having key stakeholders across the organization. So like I mentioned before, we're on our journey to understand right now what our baseline emissions are. So we've got the operational piece and now we're working on what our financed emissions actually are. And so we've partnered with a number of external organizations, understanding that we don't have the skill set at this time right now in house to do all of those calculations and scenario modeling and target setting. So once we have that baseline, we'll go through the process of setting those targets and developing what our net zero strategy um, is going to be. So I would say that this is a really a journey of learning and educating, not only educating for ourselves, but for our other staff members and ultimately our owners, because at the end of the day, we want to be able to have those meaningful conversations face to face with the owners, the individuals that we're actually lending to and helping them understand um, what they can do and how us as a financial institution can help them achieve that as well. So um, I just say that at the end of the day, making sure that we have like the tone of tone at the top there to support the work that we're doing has been huge. Thank you. Uh, Jonathan, much of the groundbreaking work within the climate finance space is making um, Van City the first financial institution in Canada to potentially outpace global targets called for by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Challenge. Uh, what inspired this level of diligence? Yeah, and and you know, sure, it's, it's it, you know, we we really are on on uh, on the same journey. Uh, you know, fortunate fortunate to be a, a, a bit further along, but but everything you're going through is everything that that we have. You know, when when you talk about uh, about the IPCC uh, setting 2050 as as the moment in time where uh, organizations need to be net zero, uh, and and to be clear, our view of net zero, as I'm sure Sharzad is as well, is is not uh, you know we. We kind of get there, and then we we find the way to offset the rest. It's how close can we actually get to zero emissions, and then and then offset of that, which 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 simply is not possible to eliminate. And so when we looked at 2050, and we looked at uh, the the climate crisis that is on our doorstep, uh, we asked ourselves, you know, what is our contribution to this? We don't lend to fossil fuel companies, so our start, our starting point is different, and we live in a community. I mean, this was. You know, uh, when we were setting these these commitments, this stuff hadn't happened yet. But man, am I glad that we did it, because in the last year alone, you've had uh, a heat dome. We never used to use that phrase, um, and we never used to experience these things. We had a heat dome where uh, close to 600 people died uh, because they were uh, isolated uh, in uh, in uh, living conditions that simply uh, were not set up to deal with that kind of heat. We've had uh, a major flooding that has wiped out uh, the, the, the Vancouver's connection to the rest of Canada. We were rationing gas, we were rationing all sorts of other things. We had farmers who, whose lives uh, had changed overnight. Uh, I, I really could, could go on. And so to, to back to your question about why we see the need uh, to do this, to, to make a commitment 10 years ahead of time. Uh, your question could almost be, why don't you see a need to do it even 10 years sooner? Uh, you know, and I think that's that's an active conversation that we are we are continue to have uh, within our organization. What is that balance of of the ambition that meets the moment and the crisis that's on our doorstep, and the credibility that comes with saying? We can. We, we still think we can achieve this, and so you know it. It, it has been a real kind of uh, ongoing balance, and I will say uh, for those uh, who who maybe don't know the difference between a credit union and a bank, it's pretty fundamental to this conversation. So a bank is owned by uh, by shareholders uh, who expect uh, a, a quarterly return on uh, on the investment they've made. And also are, are more focused on profit uh, when they look at the, 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 the future 
that the organization is charting. Credit Union uh, is, is owned by its members and governed by a board that is elected by its members. And so in our case, that means that our board is a reflection of the community that we serve. And they set for us, and, and we, uh, you know, what we collectively set, I should say, uh, a triple bottom line view of what success looks like. So, you know, profits are, are absolutely part of that equation. We need to be profitable to be successful and to serve our members. But planet and people need to be on equal footing uh, as we look at what success metrics look like. So when we bring something to the board that says, you know, we want to commit to net zero by 2040, Here's uh, the plan for how we're gonna, you know, kind of understand what that looks like, but we can't tell you with certainty exactly what that's gonna look like. But we think that this is what uh, our community needs and deserves uh, from our institution. And they had lots of questions <laughs> and then they had lots more questions. Uh, and then we went and did some modeling and it took close to uh, two years to really get to the point where we could publicly make that commitment. But it still took, uh, a board of members elected, or of, 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 of directors elected by members to have the courage to say, you know, this, this is uh, the, the goal that we want to set. This is the uncertainty that we want to step into because we know that it's the right thing to do.